there you go. Um, so once again, thank you all for, for joining us tonight. Um, and uh, as Mike said, I'll, I'll be giving a little uh, overview of uh, my latest book, which is L.A. Scavenger, and uh, give you a little background as to uh, who I am, sort of how the, the book came to be. And, um, and then you'll have a chance to ask some questions afterwards. I'll do a little Q&A. Um, so, you know, you're welcome to um, use the, the Q&A section there, the chat, if uh, you have any points of clarification, but we'll, we'll go over that all at the, uh, at the end. Um, so I'll uh, start by giving you a little background as to, uh, you know, who I am, how I got here. And um, I am originally from Boston, so uh, not an Angelino by by birth, but um, I've been here for about 12 years and uh, really just loved the city as soon as I arrived and uh, really took to exploring all the uh, the farthest corners and uh, just getting to know all the history of the city and um, just uh, all the, the great food and and, and places to go. Um, so I started writing for a few different outlets um, online and um, and in print. So uh, Time Out Los Angeles, Thrill List, uh, LAist, KCT. Um, so covering just a, a wide variety of topics um, from you know food and beverage to um, to history and and all the sort of fun uh, quirks of the city. And uh, and fun places, fun things to do, um, and it's just something I've always kind of loved doing. Even when I grew up uh, in the, the Boston area, and I lived in New York as well for a while, and uh, I've just always enjoyed exploring and, and uh, finding little hidden gems. Um, so I uh, so I took to doing that for a while, and I was also uh, for a good while a, a food tour guide. So I took people on walking food tours uh, with a company called Six Taste, and we would walk around. Uh, guide people on uh, neighborhoods throughout LA and you get to sample five or six restaurants. And I talk about the history of the restaurants and the neighborhood and fun little hidden secrets like that. Um, it's always a lot of fun and uh, and delicious uh, surprises along the way. Um, and then in uh, 2018, I was invited to write uh, my first book, which is 100 Things to Do in Los Angeles Before You Die. Um, so that was sort of the, the bucket list uh, essential cool places to check out, um, both for visitors and tourists alike. Um, so, you know, if you're just just arriving in the city, you're kind of trying to get your bearings, and uh, this is kind of the cool experiences to check out. Uh, but also for those who've lived here all their lives or, or for you know years, um, to kind of rediscover some places or you know find places that they um, had always wanted to check out uh, or find some new twist to to an old familiar spot. And, uh, you know, it was always one of my favorite things to hear uh, with, with the books and, and with the food tours as well. You know, someone to say, and I lived here all my life for 40 years and, and I never knew this was here. And, you know, just sort of helping people sort of rediscover and uh, gain a deeper appreciation for the city. Um, so that's been that's been really great. And with the 100 things, uh, then the publisher asked me to uh, come back for Secret Los Angeles. Um, a Guide to the Weird, Wonderful, and Obscure, uh, which was uh, more under the radar, kind of deeper dives into some of the, the quirkier places, you know, uh, outdoor sculptures, things like some of you might be familiar with Chicken Boy uh, over in Highland Park, who used to be downtown, um, and uh, some other just, you know, fun, fun historic buildings. Um, and so that was just a really great uh, piece to put together, book to put together. And then um, the the latest book, which you'll be learning about tonight, is Los Angeles Scavenger. And so um, that will be uh, sort of, they all sort of work together. Um, there's some places that are, are covered, you know, or a little bit of uh, connection there, um, but they do it in all, you know, different, different ways. So um, I'll be going into a little bit more about how Scavenger works and, and sort of the, the background, but essentially it's a, uh, scavenger hunt of 22 neighborhoods across Los Angeles, and um, there's over uh, nearly 350 clues that I've written. And um, actually, while I'm while I'm saying that, I will um, actually start the slideshow, and so you'll have a chance to kind of uh, get an overview of the the book, and also have the chance to solve some of the uh, some of the riddles uh, that I've written for the book, um, just to kind of give you a little uh, sample of uh, of what you can expect from it. 
Um, so let me share here. Right. Yeah. We're in a lot of this. So there are the uh the covers of the two books, um, to kind of uh give you a sense of what they look like. And um, as I mentioned with the Los Angeles scavenger, uh, 22 neighborhoods. Uh, so that includes neighborhoods all across uh, LA, uh, the city of LA, but also um, surrounding cities of Pasadena, Santa Monica, Culver City, Beverly Hills, um, 338 clues total. We'll go into a little bit more about the clues, how they work, but they, um, they're about 11 to 19 clues per neighborhood. And they feature uh, famous landmarks, buildings, uh, public art, and uh, everything that can be seen from the outside. So, um, so that way uh, you can do it any time of day. Uh, you don't have to go into places to find these things. Um, and I also included uh, public transportation and parking tips. And uh, I mentioned uh, public transportation too. It is uh, encouraged that you uh, walk these uh, these scavenger hunts. Um, and as you can see, these shoes were uh, were what helped me get through uh, the writing of this book. So I uh, started with uh, just sort of a regular pair of sneakers. And I was walking around, you know, and what I do is I research the neighborhoods ahead of time and figure out, okay, what are the some of the major landmarks and, and famous sites that I want to include. Uh, but then of course, I go and walk the neighborhood to you know take one to take photos for the book um, but also just to kind of experience it and in doing so found that you know there were some places i didn't think to to include or didn't realize that would be really great to have in there um, or found that you know some places were a little too far afield um because i wanted it to be something that you could do in a you know in an afternoon or you could break it up into to a couple afternoons um but i wanted them to be within you know, a close proximity that you find one clue, you're able to then find the next clue after that. Um, so no, no sponsorship from uh, New Balance yet, but they, uh, these shoes definitely, the 990s, if you know them, uh, are really comfortable walking shoes. And this is how uh, the clues work. So uh, I was an English major, and uh, I also was an actor for a while and uh, performed Shakespeare. And uh, so each of the clues, uh, all this sort of came in handy because each of the clues were written as a quatrain with two rhyming couplets. Um, so the rhyme scheme is A-A-B-B -B, um, and they were written iambic pentameter. Um, so you've got the, the five double beats uh, or 10 syllables. And uh, these are sort of parameters that the publisher, my publisher, Reedy Press, um, which is based in St. Louis, they sort of have found local writers in various cities who will sort of write the the very the series um and uh that was sort of the the general parameters for that as far as how it was written but then it was kind of up to us to find the places write everything take the photos etc um so the clues as I, I mentioned before they highlight um sort of the look of the landmark um as well as a bit of trivia and some history uh, to sort of help you find it and give you some context for it. Um, and then there's also uh, crop photos. I mentioned I went around and took photos of everything. And um, the photos are are done in a way so that you kind of see maybe the corner of a building. Um, so you might recognize the one there. Um, and uh, that to give you a little bit more of a clue uh, to find the, the location. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, you, once you find one of the clues, um, you'll generally find another one within uh, close distance. Um, and I try to include a mix of clues that were, um, you know, some a little more apparent than others, and then some that would be a challenge. Um, so kind of give everybody, if you're new, again, new to the city um, and exploring, or if you're really familiar with the neighborhood, um, it's still gonna give you the chance to kind of see the city in a new way and see each of these neighborhoods um, sort of in new light. And I know, 
Um, there was something for me that, you know, I've all, as I mentioned, always been exploring and, and love uh, exploring LA, uh, but focusing the way I did with this book and finding the, you know, the sort of architectural details or some of these fun clues um, just gave me a gave me a deeper appreciation, and now has me looking, you know, up in uh, all the corners of buildings and all sorts of places, uh, looking for, you know, the context and, and history of these places. Um, so hopefully uh, you'll find the same. Um, so we'll jump into the one of the first clues. Um, so you have a chance to uh, to give that a try. I'm just realizing I can't see the. Oh, there we go. Okay. I want to make sure I can see the chat. Give you all a chance to take a guess there. All right, so the first clue, built in 1896 to ship fruit, then as a red car stop to commute. Mustard yellow with brown trim, now restored for a fresh cup of coffee, all aboard. If anyone wants to, I'll give, well, this might help too, uh, because you'll know within the, the book, you'll know the neighborhood. So you can at least have a, a starting point there. Um, this is in North Hollywood. So I don't know if anyone wants to give a, give a stab there in the, the chat and try to guess. There we go, Steve, the NoHo coffee shop across the street from the Red Line stop. Exactly. So thank you, Steve. Um, sure, so, you know, plenty of others of you figured it out and we're just shy in the chat. Don't, don't be shy. Um, so I'll give you a little more background on this. Uh, this is also known as the Lancashire Depot. Um, and it is there on uh, Chandler Boulevard, Lancashire Boulevard. And it is, you see, a, a uh, oh, some people had zero idea. That's okay too. Um, as I say, you'll, you'll, some will be more of a challenge than others, and and you'll, you'll get them. Uh, so to give you a little uh, background here, the Lancashire Depot, uh, as I mentioned, for shipping fruit in the Clue, uh, built in 1896, and it was connected the the Valley's agricultural industry. Um, all those great uh, citrus orchards and, and other um, agriculture to the ports. Um, and it's also considered the building itself is the San Fernando Valley's oldest unmodified railroad structure um, and one of the oldest uh, surviving structures there as well. Um, so I got a great image there, the Toluca Flyer uh, from 1900, one of the, the trains that would ship. And uh, as the years went on, it's, it's rolled evolved as well with the city. Um, so 1911 and 1952, it served as the, for the Pacific Electric Rail, excuse me, Pacific Electric Red Car uh, Station for the Van Nuys Line. Um, some of you might remember that. And uh, as well as later on um, as a building supply store too, uh, after it closed as a red car stop. And then it uh, it sat vacant for a while, um, but it was purchased in Met by Metro in 1993. Um, they sort of didn't know what to do with it for a while there. You may have seen it fenced off um, until 2011 um, when they began a, a massive overhaul, $3.6 million, um, and restored it to look as it did as a Pacific Electric station, um, right down to the, the colors and rebuilt the chimney and added the signs back there. And then in uh, 2017, Groundwork Coffee opened up in the space. And uh, if you haven't been, highly recommend it. Just get a uh, great cup of coffee and some pastries, as you see there. Um, great, uh, great starting point for a scavenger hunt. So um, definitely recommend checking it out. Now we'll move on to our next clue. Uh, so now we're heading uh, to another part of town. We're going to head to over to Boyle Heights. Uh, so some of you might be uh, recognize the, the top of this building. And I'll give you the clue. Brick building and turret with bell-shaped bell top. First floor, a lending library bookshop. A hotel built in 1889. Now affordable housing, restored shine. 
Any guesses in the chat? Cummins Block. Excellent. Thank you, Terrence. So this is the Cummins Block, also known as the Boyle Hotel. Uh, so right there, First Avenue and Boyle Avenue, First Street and Boyle Avenue. Um, and this is, uh, jump ahead here. Um, it was completed in 1889. Um, so as mentioned, known as the, the Cummins Block, uh, as Victorian Italianette uh, style. And um, one of the oldest commercial buildings in Los Angeles remaining. Um, so it was built for uh, community leaders, George Cummings, where the, the name came from. Uh, along with his wife. And um, as you, know, you see a photo there from 1889, uh, when it was first built. Uh, I'm not sure how, how well you can see it on your screen there, uh, but it's just one of these great photos here. We've got people up here in the, the Belvedere and the turret and uh, everyone posing for the, the photo. And a great, one of my favorite shots there. Um, and the Building itself was also well positioned, um, as it was uh, right there where the red car line uh, helped to um, start, connect the area with downtown LA and really help encourage growth uh, in the area in Boyle Heights. Uh, and then, as the uh, as the years went on, the the sort of use and, and purpose of it evolved. Um, so it operated as a hotel up until 1918, um, and that's when the upper floors were converted into apartments. Um, so beginning in the 1930s, um, it became known uh, as colloquially as the uh, Mariachi Hotel. Um, so many of the musicians that would gather um, in the plaza uh, would rent rooms up there. Um, so we also know uh, Mariachi Plaza is there now. Um, so they would, uh, you know, rehearse and perform, and um, you know, sort of look to to be hired for for birthday parties, quinceañeras, and uh, other celebrations. And then, unfortunately, as the years went on, it fell into disrepair. Um, late twentieth century, and um, they over the years lost that uh, turret on the top. And, um, and and fortunately, then in 2012, the East Los Angeles Community Court, uh, a nonprofit developer, restored the building, uh, undergoing a $25 million restoration. Um, so restoring the uh, the turret there, as well as uh, converting into affordable housing um, at a community center uh, that is able to be used by the the mariachi uh, musicians, as well as other community groups, and um, and then really did a great job of restoring that and opened up uh, the retail spaces there. And as someone, uh, Steve mentioned in the, the comments there, Libro Schmibros, which is a fantastic uh, place if you haven't been. Um, so here's a little shot of the interior and it's a, a lending library. Um, the goal is to put low or no cost books into all hands, native and immigrant, east side and west. Um, so it was first opened across the plaza in 2010 and uh, features books both in English and Spanish. It also offers, uh, they offer community events, children's reading hour, and uh, writing workshops. So really a uh, great place to check out. And then next door as well is uh, La Monarca Bakery. They have a few locations around town as well, so you may have checked them out, but really great uh, for getting uh, freshly baked desserts as well as uh, handmade tortillas and uh, all sorts of other delicious treats. So again, another place uh, to stop in if you're uh, exploring the neighborhood. Um, as I mentioned too, I did do the food tour. So I like to try and tie in, uh, tie in a bit of food to some of these. For the next clue, we're gonna hop down to Lamert Park. Um, so this, uh, I'll, give, I'll read the clue and then uh, see if anyone has a chance to guess. The nine-story tower is quite a sight. Soon the neon will be lit up at night. Spanish deco and a seafoam green hue, the rebirth of a historic venue. Any guesses in the comments? The Vision Theater. Love it. Excellent. Thank you. Now it's a race to uh, type in the answers there. Not really, not a race. Um, so yeah, so this is known as the Vision Theater now. Um, but when it was first built, 
Uh, here you can see an image of it in color. I mentioned that seafoam green. And there we go. Um, so when it first opened, it was open as the Lamarck Theater in 1932, a uh, Spanish colonial and art deco um, so built by Howard Hughes and Franklin Theater Company, um, along with uh, Morgan Walls and Clements. And um, it was operated by the Fox West Coast Theaters as well. Um, so many of you might be familiar uh, with Morgan Walls and Clements. Um, some of their other uh, LA landmarks include El Capitan, uh, the Mayan Theater, um, as well as the now demolished uh, Richfield Oil Tower, um, Malibu's Adamson House, and the Wiltern Theater. Um, so you get some of that, that similar uh, color there to the building. Um, and the neighborhood itself, for those who are unfamiliar with uh, Lamert Park, it is a historic neighborhood um, created by Walter H. Lamert in 1927. Um, it's considered one of the first uh, of LA's planned communities. Um, however, it was restricted to whites only, um, white, white residents only until 1948. Um, however, as uh, the, the neighborhood evolved and developed, it's now a center, thriving center of black culture and businesses. So, um, which is a great change. Um, we'll continue along and you get a chance to see a little bit more of the building. Um, so it was operated as a, a first run theater from 1932 until 68. Um, it was also known as the, the Watchtower for a while uh, when it was used by Jehovah's Witnesses in the 1970s. Um, and then by the early 90s, it was uh, renamed the Vision Theater um, when it was purchased by actor Marla Gibbs. And while it sort of fell on, on hard times and into disrepair, um, it is now owned by the city of LA and managed by the Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, it's undergone a $11 million rehabilitation in 2012. Uh, restoring sort of the front portion of the, the building there. Um, and now they're undergoing uh, further renovation, as you see in the, the rendering there, and really expand the, the building itself, adding new uh, rehearsal spaces, performance spaces, uh, and a community, uh, community center as well. Um, someone at Terrence asked if the Marla Gibbs Memory Lane Supper exists. I'm not sure. I have to. I have to look into that. If anyone else uh, knows, feel free to to chime in there. All right. Clue number four. Uh, so we're moving over to West Hollywood here. So you might just recognize it right off the bat. Um, yep, we got a guess there. Uh, so a bun and a dog restored from the past. An iconic stand reopened at last. Snappy dog since 46, quite the tale. And for fans of the doors, a fun detail. Let's see, people already saw it from the image there. And it is Tale of the Pup. You can see it in full color there, um, just Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood. And uh, the Tale of the Pup uh, first opened in 1946. And um, it is one of the most iconic examples of roadside or programmatic architecture. Um, some of you might be familiar with uh, some of the other examples. Probably the most famous one uh, would be the Brown Derby, um, which uh, you know a lot of the a lot of the examples are places where they like the tail of the pup. They would sell, uh, or the building would look like what they would sell. Um, so there was a, also a camera store on uh, Wilshire as well that looks like a giant camera that's fortunately still there, uh, I think just covered up currently. Um, and uh, it was oh, it was Aaron Spelling's favorite year, yeah, I like it. Um, yeah, so a big fan, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people uh, really loved the tale of the pup, um, served hot dogs at the Beverly Park Kitty Land. Um, so you may, may uh, recall going there. Um, so that was what, where the Beverly Center is now um, and is um, on La Cienega. And um, the pup continued to be a popular destination uh, as the years went on. It was eventually sold to Eddie Blake in 76. Um, unfortunately, they had to relocate it as it was threatened by demolition um, and uh, moved it to San Vicente, San Vicente Boulevard in 1986. Um, and it's appeared in countless movies and commercials, photo shoots, 
Uh, you've probably seen some of them with the Go-Go's or uh, Sigourney Weaver, kind of some of the more famous ones. Um, and then in 2005, uh, the Tale of Pop closed. Uh, the family that owned it moved into moved into storage uh, in hopes of finding a, a new place for it. But um, as I'm sure many of you sort of saw it disappear uh, or noticed that it disappeared, um, the fate was uncertain. So there's a lot of um, a lot of anxiety around that. But fortunately, in 2018, the 1933 group acquired both the brand and the original building, um, underwent an extensive renovation, and were able to move it uh, only blocks away from the original site. Um, so it's, um, as someone mentioned, I saw in the, the comments there, and it was mentioned the clue about uh, the Doors fans, um, the building where they moved it uh, was once used as a studio for the Doors um, when they, um, as you'll see in the, the plaque there, um, in 1970, they recorded their sixth and final album, uh, L.A. Woman. And uh, this, this is the plaque says, Jim Morrison recorded his vocals in this very bathroom. I can't, uh, you know, attest to that for certain, but um, I did find that the acoustics were really nice in there. So, so that was good. Um, could be true. Um, and uh, some of you might be familiar with the 1933 group as well. They've done uh, a number of other um, restoration projects around the city. They uh, helped to restore the Highland Park Bowl, um, which was uh, which considered the, the oldest bowling alley in LA, and they were able to um, uh, pull back some of the the um, drop ceiling and and um, some of the paint that covered uh, this beautiful uh, mural from the 30s, and um, just sort of repurposed a lot of the old pin setters and um, really did a great job with that, as well as um, Idle Hour in North Hollywood and um, a uh, number of other locations around town. Um, so from there, I'll continue along. We have one more clue, give you a chance. Uh, heading over to Los Feliz. And uh, some of you might be familiar with this. Yeah, right away. Uh, more gifting than trading at this small store. Custom t-shirts, fun mugs, tchotchkes galore. Peer inside to see a famous sign, two feet, one sad, one doing just fine. So this is kind of a, a double header of a clue. Um, so I see someone uh, someone guessed there the location as EK Trading Post uh, right there on, uh, on Vermont and, um, and Melbourne. And uh, EK is a, is a really fun, uh, quirky spot to check out if you haven't been there, uh, run by artist Bill Wyatt, uh, one of the few places left in town. You can get a custom uh, screen printing for your shirt, for a shirt. Um, and also plenty of uh, fun uh, LA-centric uh, t-shirts and uh, sunglasses, as I mentioned, novelty mugs, lots of tchotchkes. Um, the... Uh, the hat there is to commemorate P22, the recently passed mountain lion of Griffith Park. Um, his latest installation includes a craps table uh, with chips made of tortillas, actual tortilla chips. Um, so a lot of uh, fun, uh, fun things to explore in there. Um, but there's one bit of local lore uh, that really stands out from the rest, and that is the happy foot, sad foot sign. Um, so uh, many of you might recognize this sign, um, not necessarily from the store, uh, but from its original location where it stood on Sunset Boulevard uh, and Benton Way. And uh, it was put up there in 1986 for uh, Gary Jameson's foot clinic. And uh, the sign would slowly rotate to reveal the, uh, the you know, the happy foot, as you see there, healthy foot, uh, as well as the one with the bandage toe and the crutches. Uh, and just pained expression there. Um, and for many people who were uh, driving by there, oh, I should mention, uh, so Jameson uh, enlisted the artistic talents of his son, Russell, um, while he was still in elementary school uh, to dry the, the feet there. Um, he has since gone on to have a successful career in animation, but uh, for many of us, this is uh, probably his most uh, memorable and lasting impact on LA. Um, and it is since uh, it's a, went after it was uh, it was put up there developed uh, a bit of a cult following um, as sort of a modern day oracle. So if you were driving by and you happened to look up and you saw the happy foot 
you felt, all right, I'm gonna have a good day. This is a, a good sign. But if it happened to be rotating and you saw the sad foot, well then trouble was afoot. Um, so uh, some people took it you know, very seriously. Um, there were even a number of uh, songs that were uh, written about it or mentioned it, um, as well as uh, mentioned in novels by uh, Jonathan Latham and uh, David Foster Wallace. Um, people started getting, uh, you know, tattoos from it and uh, all sorts of uh, funny tributes, uh, as you see here, the uh, the pins and and uh, lunch boxes. Um, however, it was uh, as sort of a, a running theme as you'll you've probably gathered here. Um, it was uh, under threat. So um, the uh, Dr. Thomas Lynn, who is a podiatrist who took over the the clinic there uh, from Jameson. Um, he was moving and unfortunately couldn't take the sign with him. Um, and the new occupants were planning to potentially alter it. Um, so there was a, a effort to save the sign. There was fundraiser um, helped in, in part by Bill Wyatt of uh, EK, uh, EK Trading. And um, they did a fundraiser. And then um, one day, uh, Bill happened to be driving by, and he noticed the the workers you see in the photo on the left there, um, starting to take the sign down. And it, it wasn't, uh, you know, he had, he had been in touch with uh, Dr. Lim as far as trying to find a new home for it. So this wasn't a, a planned thing. Um, so he uh, kind of camped out in front of it and made some some panicked, urgent phone calls to to try and prevent its removal or find a new location. And uh, wasn't able to find any place except for his own shop. And um, he was able to move it in there, as you see in the photo on the left there. Um, it's a pretty small shop for those who've been, and the sign is quite large, as you can see there. Um, so he was able to restore it and uh, or, you know, preserve it and uh, move it to the, the shop. And uh, even though it doesn't rotate as it once did, telling uh, telling your fortune, uh, you still can go in there. They've got a bit of a wheel of fortune. You can have a spin and uh, see how your day is going to turn out. Um, so that is uh, the final clue we'll get to check out. And um, I'll just, before we wrap up here, I'll give um, just a little overview. Like I mentioned, it's uh, the book itself is is you know both for locals and visitors as well. Um, a lot of people have told me too with the with the all three books really, um, but it's sort of a fun thing to have on your coffee table. Uh, so when people do come to town um, and you're trying to think, oh, what can I do? I can get out of my sort of routine. We all got our favorite places we like to go, um, but this way kind of give you a chance to explore more of the city, show people uh, more of the city that you love. And uh, of course, people who love Los Angeles history, as um, I'm sure many of you, all of you can relate, uh, art and architecture enthusiasts. So yeah, everyone really. Um, and uh, I will leave this here too. Um, feel free to uh, follow me on uh, social media. The uh, Danny S. Jensen is my handle there on Instagram, Secret Los Angeles book. And um, as well as uh, on Facebook there, Danny Seamus and uh, feel free to email. Um, so, oh, thank you, Ann. Uh, glad they've become a little guide for you. And uh, with that, I'm going to exit the share and I'll pass it over, let's see, to Mike and um, see if we have any uh, questions. Okay. Well, uh, at the moment, we don't have any open questions, but anyone definitely feel free to pop into the uh, Q&A section, and I'll read the questions off to Danny as we go. But um, uh, Danny, just to make sure that when you were putting all of these things together, I'm guessing that there's a certain etiquette that is kind of built into uh, establishing a scavenger hunt where all the places that you've gone to you're doing so with the permission of the owners. Uh, it's during business hours. And so there's not going to be anything that you're going to be putting people in any kind of jeopardy to, you know, take these excursions. Is that correct? Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. No, uh, nothing illegal needs to be done. And uh, 
want everybody to be to be safe and um yeah the way the way it was designed is um so everything is uh is accessible um really 24 hours a day um you know you probably want to go to in the daytime and see everything better um but uh yeah you know as i went around i of course talked to um the various businesses but also um you know wanted to make it so that even if uh, the business was closed you know if you have yeah, only went on a weekend and they're only open during, open during the week um you could still find these places um and still check them out um you know you of course want to use sort of you know kind of common sense and just sort of keep your your wits about you don't want to be looking up at a you know uh building and and trip on the sidewalk so um be safe but um but yeah everything is um uh you know in places that you can you can find and you know in a lot of these too it's um I, I chose locations that are kind of along like a main drag, main street, or um, so that one, so it's just sort of easier to to find, um, but also, you know, you have a chance to um, kind of get to know the neighborhood. Um, and I encourage you to, you know, go into the, the businesses, check them out. Um, there's, uh, as I mentioned, restaurants and bookstores and um, all sorts of places. And I think it's um, just a great place, you know, great way to, to get to know, um, these different neighborhoods in LA, um, you know, it's sort of the the old adage of nobody walks in LA, um, thanks to to missing persons. But um, but you know, I really wanted people to to be able to walk uh, and you know get out of the car and, and get to know these neighborhoods and realize you know how how walkable they they really are. Okay. Do you have any? Uh, are there any any thoughts as to how long? one of these scavenger hunts might uh, might take it. Did you actually have it planned that, well, what could you do in say two hours versus three hours versus four hours? And does a group size come into play at all as you're organizing and coordinating these things? Yeah, so um, I, I think I mentioned a little bit in the, in the intro to the book, but, um, the most of the neighborhoods I've set up so you could do it, you know, depending on your your pace and how many places you want to stop in and check out. Um, but you could do it, you could do it in an afternoon and say three or four hours. Um, some of them are a little bigger. So um, for instance, Hollywood, downtown, um, they have more clues. And so um, you know, and the, there's just a lot to see. And uh sometimes, you know, it'd be uh, busy with crowds, but, um, you know, so some of those you might want to, I mean, if you've got the data dedicated to it, then, then that's great. Um, but it's also something you kind of, you know, start as you, you know, do one afternoon and, and then, uh, return another time and, uh, check things off. Um, you'll see in the book, there's a little space for notes. So you can kind of write down the ones, you know, found this one or, you know, take a break here and, uh, revisit it. Um, and as far as group size, I mean, it's really, you know, up, uh, up to you. It's, um, you could do it solo if, if you're, um, kind of want to have the, your own pace and, and the, the joy of, uh, finding them on your own, or you can go, uh, with a, with a partner, with a group, family, friends, um, you know, I, I don't know, I'd say there's a, a limit on it, but, you know, probably only just limited by, how many of you can fit on the sidewalk and, and um, make your way through there? Um, so yeah, yeah, no, no limit. I see. I just saw one uh, question there as far as the signed copies available anywhere. Uh, excellent question. I can't believe I didn't mention this, um, but I saw. Let's see. I'll share the the link, um, but you can get the signed copies directly from me. Um, so we'll go. I'll share my website in the chat. And um, sorry, one second. There it is. Um, this in the chat here. So it's secretlosangelesbook.com. You can even click on that link. And oh, no, that just went to panelists. Sorry, everyone. Let me try that one more time. There we go. Um, so yeah, I said uh, Secret Los Angeles book. Uh, dot com and um, you can grab the uh, scavenger book um, but you can also grab the other books as well um, and you actually get a, a discount so if you buy 
um, uh, two titles or, or three different titles, um, you get 10% off. And uh, I'll sign those. You can always leave a note, um, you know, if you want me to, to dedicate it to anyone or, or just sign it, that's fine too. Um, so yeah, I encourage you all to to go there. You know, you will find it in uh, in bookstores around LA as well. Um, but uh, but this way you can, you know, uh, get the signed copy and uh, support me directly, and um, that would be great. And maybe the Historical Society can, uh, you know, buy a couple of sets, autographed, of course, and uh, maybe raffle them off during the uh, the Archives Bazaar in late October. And that, yeah. you know, might be a nice uh, nice incentive. Absolutely, that'd be great for, uh, for people. Uh, very, uh, very quickly, if you had to pick one that was your absolute favorite, first one off the top of your head, which one would it be? Oh boy, oh, off the top of my head. Um, I mean, I would say Lamar Park. Um, that's one that was a neighborhood that I I hadn't explored myself um, prior to this, and um, it's a it's a really great, vibrant area to to check out. Um, the great uh, jazz club down there, um, great galleries and uh, a museum as well. Um, they do a lot of um, street festivals, so uh, a really cool place to check out that I think um, kind of flies under a lot of people's radar. So I think that would be. That would be one. Okay, uh, still waiting for that, uh, you know, first question. I'm kind of hoping that uh, people won't be bashful to, uh, you know, jump in and ask questions. But um, uh, that being the case, uh, obviously, right now we're kind of dealing with, uh, you know, rather extreme weather. So I imagine that is there a cool scavenger hunt i mean cool in the literal sense is there a scavenger hunt in the book that might lend itself to going inside where there's at least air conditioning or you know maybe slightly cooler <laughs> environs to take advantage of during this uh hot spell that we happen to be in the middle of yeah good question um i mean i would say you know I'm over on the west side. I live in Mar Vista. Um, so we do tend to stay a little bit cooler over here. We have a bit of that uh, marine layer and, and uh, ocean breeze. So, you know, if you wanted to to pick uh, an area that might be a little cooler, I'd say uh, we got Venice in there and, uh, and Santa Monica. Um, and then otherwise, I would say maybe Miracle Mile would be another great one um, because you have the uh, um, uh, museums there that you can you can pop in for uh, from air conditioning and uh, a few other you know restaurants and, and places along the way um, yeah I would say those those would be good I mean Hollywood too there's plenty of places to, to pop in and out um, uh, I was recommending going to the the Roosevelt Hotel um, nice and cool in there and uh, beautiful architecture. Um, so that's a good one. And um, and really nice bathrooms too. You know, sometimes you need a break. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that would be my recommendations. Um, oh, I think I just see, it looks like maybe some folks are asking questions in the, just in the chat, which is cool. Um, if, uh, if people are not clever, is there an answer key in the book? Um, so I'm sure you're more clever than you're giving yourself credit for. Um, but I would say uh, there isn't a, there is not an answer key. Um, there's sort of part of the, the uh, you know, parameters of the book. Um, but, uh, you know, I would say, you know, go through the, you know, as you go through the, the book, um, you know, you may want to do what I, kind of what I did is like, uh, when I was researching it is, is look at the clues ahead of time, you know, sort of before you go, um, because I'm sure there's going to be ones that, that pop out to you, you know, you see the, the photo and you see the date uh, or maybe the description of the building and you'll kind of zero in on, on that particular landmark. Um, and I think kind of use that as your, your starting point. Um, so that way you can say, all right, it's like, you know, your map, your Google maps to that location start there and know that you know once you start looking around those spots you're going to start solving those those other clues um it's also a great time when you know to to call upon uh friends and, and family members and you kind of use your your collective brain power to uh to solve the clues and um worst comes to worst 
ping me on Instagram and uh, I can I can help you out there. So as a Bostonian, when you first got here, you started putting some of this stuff together. And even when you were doing the food tours and those sorts of things, was there one singular location that kind of caught you by surprise or has stuck with you whenever you know, you've worked on these things and you know you you decided I had to include this or is there one that you have yet to include that you would like to include mm. so I would say um I mean what my, my mind always goes this but um the magic castle is uh kind of one that that captured my uh sort of attention early on um and um it's uh you know for those who haven't been there um the academy academy of magicians um have this uh wonderful uh victorian home that they've, they've converted into this uh magic castle that is uh full of a variety of performing spaces and um I, uh, I recently read the, a great history about it, um, and they um, not only helped to sort of preserve that Victorian uh, home that had been there, um, but they also um, were able to retrieve some uh, features from other Victorian homes that were uh, getting torn down, and they incorporated those into the building. Um, they also had a background in, or, you know, professional experience in, in the TV industry, so utilized a lot of those. Um, so I feel like that is great because one, it's uh, spoiler alert, but it, it's one of the clues, um, but it is uh, itself kind of, you know, you kind of feel like you're on a scavenger hunt uh, when you're in there. Um, so I think that would be, that would be one, um, you know, and as far as like places that it didn't include, I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, what, what was sort of, sort of the challenge. I mean, it, it helped to keep the book focused that I had to choose, you know, a certain number of uh, clues and, and neighborhoods um, because otherwise it could just go on and on. There's so many, you know, amazing parts of LA, um, you know, between the, the valleys and, and um, South LA and other places that, you know, I kind of focused a little more on the central area. Um, but I really want this to be kind of a launching pad uh, for you to sort of get inspired and, you know, explore these neighborhoods, but also then continue to, to explore other parts of LA. And like I mentioned, kind of keep looking up and down in all the, uh, corners to, to discover some of these fun hidden places. Okay. Then of course, the inevitable question of any, uh, you know, any author or any other creative talent, what's next, what's the next project? Uh, yeah, I think once I kind of catch my breath from from this one, um, the publisher has uh, asked me to do a book on uh, sort of a food focus uh, about Los Angeles. So um, it would be um, unique eats and eateries, um, kind of uh, looking at the the longstanding institutions um, and sort of famous, uh, you know. LA, uh, LA food and, and, and businesses, restaurants. Okay. So are you opening yourself up to having people, you know, contact you as far as their suggestions for what might go into a particular project, you know, like that through your social media contacts and your Instagram and all the rest of that? Are you opening yourself up to that <laughs> kind of bombardment because i'm sure a lot of people have ideas that they would love to submit to you for that absolutely yeah i do and then for you know for all these books i did do a lot of uh a lot of crowdsourcing um just talking to to friends and and um you know other writers and and um people at, at various institutions and museums and and historical societies um so uh, yeah, I definitely uh, welcome those or, or just, you know, any, any treasures or places that, uh, that you found that you really enjoy. Um, I put my email there, but you can also um, uh, follow me on, on Instagram and, and message me there. Um, so yeah, I definitely, definitely encourage you to, to reach out. Um, and if you go to uh, my website there, um, you can sign up for 
uh, my mailing list as well. So I'll be doing um, more events, um, both uh, it's more virtual, but also uh, in-person events um, as the, the months go on. So, um, you know, you can be sure to, to follow along there and, and hopefully you can join in person. Well, that would be an absolute, that would be an absolute blast. Yeah. Well, Danny, thank you so very much for, uh, for leading us on this virtual scavenger tour. Uh, the book, the books, plural, look like a lot of fun and I'm going to have to, uh, pick them up and, uh, and practice what you're, what you're preaching to us. And so thank you very much for that. And I hope that anyone who's got any kind of uh, follow-up questions can reach out to you directly or go through the Historical Society's page. Let us know if you like the webinar. Let us know if you like this kind of uh, presentation. And as I mentioned before, the next upcoming event is already sold out, as it were. It's not so much a sale event, but it's a capacity event. The Archives Bazaar scheduled for this coming Saturday, no, uh, July 22nd, is sold out. but there will be an upcoming uh, announcement for the next tour for members only. So this is one of those member perks. And so if you take the opportunity to join the Historical Society between now and mid late October, maybe you'll be able to take advantage of the next uh, tour date. And of course, in late October, we have the, uh, the Archives Bazaar at USC, which is free to everyone. And if you've ever wondered how many different types of history are being, are being researched and curated and made available in Southern California. This is a this is you know archivist Disneyland. You know you will you will you will be surprised at how if I don't think there is one type of history that is not being covered, researched, analyzed, preserved, or protected somewhere in Southern California. This will just absolutely amaze you, and uh, and uh, Terrence. Vintner, uh, Terrence Butcher, yes, unfortunately, you have you have identified me correctly. Anyway, so with that, we are going to uh, uh, close the webinar. As I said, Danny is also our uh, program chair. And so if there's any other webinar themes that you would like to see, any other events that you would like to see, he's the guy you want to reach out to, and then he'll reach out to the rest of us and we'll make it happen. And so... Thank you to everyone who have taken time out of your Thursday evening to come along with us. And we look forward to seeing you, hopefully, seeing you hopefully in the flesh at whatever event uh, is coming down the road. Uh, but thank you and have a pleasant evening and stay cool. Thanks, everyone.